Hey everybody, Michael Francis Lai here. Welcome to another episode of our Harmonious Podcast series. I am here with author Peter Wells, and we're exploring his book, Notes from the West Pole. Today we're going to be looking at the first part of Borders of Our Perception. A few centuries ago, we woke up to the fact that the world was not flat, but a sphere. And we realized the Earth had always been a sphere, even while we had thought it flat. So now we are awakening to the realization that humanity is one whole society, one global economy, one family of beings in a shared environment. No matter how we divide ourselves between good and evil or Republican and Democrat or black and white or Christian, Muslim and Jew, our divisions are imposed on an already existing unity. This fundamental condition that we share, the human soul, is unchangeable by religion or government or by any authority whatsoever. Our ancestors designed the systems and built the institutions that we've inherited, each generation modifying the social structure according to the priorities of the time. When the American colonies threw out the British and constituted a new government, they kept one very important ingredient from British rule. The idea that the ruling power, whether by king or government, wields absolute power over every person and may force its laws, wars, punishments on all. We're still subject to that power in the form of a national government that recognizes no greater authority than its own and sustains its power by the compulsory rule of law. Each person must submit to an adversarial legal and political system that requires that we struggle with each other for justice and for power. We've been taught to struggle as a way of thought and as a way of life. This condition pervades every aspect of the culture enforced by an absolute authority over all. Our predicament is we've inherited a social system that works well for a society of opponents and adversaries. So long as we divide ourselves between friends and enemies and winners and losers, then the present order of society is workable. However, if our vision is of a more harmonious social order, in which human society is perceived as a whole, and in which human conflict is seen as a condition to be avoided or healed, then the present system won't get us there. Today, We inhabit a new age, a global age that includes all the races, all the religions, and every nation. We are living together here, sharing the same origins, the same conditions, and the same destiny, and yet all around the planet we are stuck in the mode of man against man, nation against nation. Many of us see the absurdity and the tragedy of this way of life, but feel powerless to intervene. Human self-destruction is sponsored by national governments that recognize no other authority than their own and condoned by religious institutions that recognize no other morality than their own. None of these governments serves humanity as a whole, but each pursues its own supposed national interests regardless of its effect on the rest of the human family. There have been radical changes in the human experience over the past few centuries, but our governmental, political, and legal systems have not kept pace. Our social institutions were designed and built many years ago by warriors for warriors with ideals of dominance and conquest and defeating the opposition. 
Now our need is for a new generation of institutions that function for the benefit of the individual person and the whole human family, and in fact, the whole planet. There is an ancient truth that humanity has known forever, but which remains a secret to this civilization. We are directed from a source beyond our reasoning. This source is not in the legislatures, not in the seats of power, not in the temples or the churches. It's not outside of us. This source is within ourselves. We are possessed by an unconscious intelligence that somehow has arranged our moving parts into a living whole that does what it is doing, whether or not we think, whether or not we legislate. This intelligence is the pilot of this life, using the mind as one tool, one sense in a symphony of sensations. This intelligence is at work within each one of us and throughout all humanity. All right. So I really appreciate this piece, Peter. There's, it seems like almost every single line in there is just teeming with meaning and it just, it really just hits you. And, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed about listening to this piece, um, is that a lot of this work, a lot of the, a lot of your book is about really pointing to developing a new social system. That's what it seems like a lot of this work is geared towards. Um, and in order for us to bring about this new sh- social system, w- w- what do you think that entails? What do, you, what do you think that means for us to actually bring about this new system? Well, the change, as we've been talking about, is in the person releasing themselves from outside authorities and finding their own inner truth and living according to that rather than the instructions that have come from the institutions and the government. Because our governmental systems are all based on a division in not only in the whole humanity, but also within the human being. And that division is really false now. It was valid a few, maybe thousands of years ago, but it's no longer appropriate We have an old system that is not working, and the solution to it is from within ourselves. Hmm. So if we did have a system that was built on wholeness, as you are saying, what, what what would that look like? Like, what would that look like for our daily lives? What would that look like economically, governmentally? What would that look like to build a new system based off of wholeness? Well, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> but it, it's the whole predicament is yes the economic, the political, uh, the spiritual, all of it is in the person, and so we have to move forward with that f- freedom. We haven't been freed all around the world. The whole planet is being run as if the person is inconsequential. And it's the government, the ruler, the tyrant who is in charge of the person. And the person can be forced at gunpoint to do what the government or the ruler dictates. Now what we're doing, the the transition that we're in, is we're believing in ourselves more and more as the systems kind of collapse. And so... The, the movement is to include us, just as the American Constitution or the Declaration of Independence says that we want a system with the consent of the governed. Well, that's personal freedom. If consent is required, then we're free. And that's really what we need to put into effect. What we really need, the next change, is towards a true democracy with the consent of the governed and with the freedom of each and every one of us. How to organize that? It's already organized into a certain form. What we're really 
dealing with, I think, is a change in the consciousness so that we look at this predicament in a different way. We don't see it as being divided. We don't see it as being us against them. We see it as a whole condition that we now need to be able to organize and be a part of. That's a big step. But it is the true democracy, the idea that we're free and equal beings and operating with that freedom, with the consent of the governed, to share the democracy. So we're a long way away from that. And what I'm suggesting is that we step towards that. And the, the, the fundamental part of it is the freedom of the person. It's the sovereignty of the person. It's no longer the sovereignty of the nation that's most important. What is now most important is the sovereignty of the person because our solutions are not going to come from governance. They're not going to come from an outside power. They're going to come from within us. Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of people um, nowadays that are moving in that direction. I mean, what I see today as as a young person, um, there's a whole bunch of people that are, you know, starting eco communities, starting eco villages, um, kind of a back to the earth sort of movement, getting very involved with permaculture and building these sustainable systems that are aligned with nature. And um, I know you you kind of lived through the 60s and the 70s and you came out to Northern California back to this whole um, back to the earth type of movement. So that was something that you really um, embodied on your journey is that finding that alternative path. So can you talk about that a little bit, what that, what that was for you? Well, you know, th- I bought a piece of property that enabled me to live there somewhat self-sufficiently. You know, we're close to the ocean as well. We could get fish. We could grow food. Um, We did that because we could see that the whole thing was falling apart, that we there could be a time when we wouldn't be able to depend on the supermarket, for example, transportation. Um, So, yeah, we had that kind of uh, warning in the late 60s. And then in the early 70s, you know, Nixon was deposed and he resigned. And the presidency has been in kind of chaos ever since. And we haven't replaced it with anything. We keep on replacing presidents with presidents who change the rules, who change the regime in different ways and make it almost impossible uh, to relate to other nations because the variation from one president to another is so great. We just went from Obama to Trump. That's quite a leap (laughs) or quite a fall, depending on what you want to say about it. Mm -hmm. But our system is not working. What we have to do, it seems to me, is take responsibility within ourselves and then work towards what we want. That can only sensibly happen in small groups. You can't expect millions and millions of people to suddenly conform to that. They've been conformed by a majority rule situation that says the power is over you and that you have to submit to the majority. That keeps the people divided. And we don't really benefit from being divided. We have to build anew. And that that what we build with is our own consciousness. And the question is, what are we doing here? How do we want to live in this marvelous planet? How do we want to relate? And it has to begin from the absolute primary form of relationships, which is parents, child, family. How the family relates to the community is then the most important thing. Now, if the power is actually over us and we've got armed police saying we have to do this and that, then it cuts off the inner truth that we all respect and that we all know that we want. So... The game ahead, I think, is 
a new story, a new understanding, a fresh understanding of what we're doing here. And then coming down to the individual working with consent by agreement towards a mutual benefit. Hmm. And um, one of the main things I just heard you say was that you felt like it, it really began with our primary relationships. So the family, you said, and, and really um, starting there as far as integrating this new consciousness that you talk about and building these new systems. And do you feel like you've done that with your family? Because you're, you're a father of seven, <laughs> you know, and you've, you've had three mothers to these children. So is that something you feel like you've implemented? That's part of the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> the um, No, I don't think so. I think this is a, a work in progress. And I, I think the component of it that uh, we could discuss is the fact that every single person is born from a mother and father. This is not a matter of consciousness. It's already ha- it's the only way we get here, and it's already happening. That structure, parents and child, has fallen apart. It's not really, except in certain cases, of course, it will always work. But divorce, separation, and conflict between mother and father absolutely disturb the life of the child. So we have to have another understanding about that, which is that the mother and father and the child are a permanent, a permanent trinity. And that that condition is the foundation of our society. If that's working, if mother, father, and child are all being that and taking responsibility in that, then we have a different society. At the moment, the child can be believed that he's not important. It's not important what's happening with the parents. They're divorced. Oh, well, there they go. I'm going to live my life. But the, the relationship is permanent. The conditions that we experience come from our parents, first genetically, and then secondly in behavior and, and teachings. And our condition is dependent on that. At the moment... Because in the belief of separation and divorce and that the relationship ends, the child is really kind of abandoned. And if he goes to the government or goes to some kind of social system for help, he might get some help. He won't get love. He won't get real support. He won't feel strong. Mm. He will feel split and difficult and complicated and probably because our culture is so difficult to follow, you'll feel alienated. So that now has become a natural condition for teenagers, for example. They have to pass through this rite of passage of finding out who they are and who to belong to. Mm -hmm. And if we know that we belong to our parents, even though they they may not have our respect, they may not have any, we may not have any confidence in them, but that's the one connection. And it's unconscious. It's not chosen. It's built into a genetic system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's tricky in today's world because I work with kids and when I go and um, teach, you know, and I, I watch the families come and drop their kids off and, and pick them up. It's, it's very rare that you see parents that are actually together these days. It's like the norm that they're divorced. And so I get that you're saying that that's, that connection is eternal, um, mo- mother, father, child. Um, but how do you honor that if mommy and daddy aren't getting along? You know, if there's an unhealthy relationship there, if there's abuse, how do you preserve that and still allow people to have their freedom? Well, You know, I think it goes back a long way that we've honored that. We've honored the parents. The child has honored the parents. And through that has got a certain amount of confidence, strength, support, love. Um, But now we have this sense of disintegration. And all I can say is that the disintegration leads to the same place, which is to the inner being having the ability to live the life it wants to live, not following a prescribed dictatorial authority, but 
finding within and from every other life that's being lived, from experiencing entertainments, books, there's a lot to be discovered. Even, you know, the holy books repeat some of these fundamental understandings. So we have to work on ourselves, and it's one person at a time. And we change our consciousness from within. And with a changed consciousness, we do something else. We don't know what that is yet. It's, it's arriving. <clears throat> because as you say, there are more and more people going through this sense of alienation, of not belonging. And it's the belonging that we need to foster. We need to have the support of the person, the baby born, as significant and real and complete as possible. And that will only really come from the parents. If the parents are not able to, which is probably widespread right now, there's probably millions and millions of families where the parents neither talk to each other nor have any <clears throat> ability to heal the relationship. So the child is left in this funny kind of uh, separation throughout its life. Yeah, I, you know, I kind of picked up on something um, in what I heard you saying, and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm kind of interpreting it uh, correctly. And it was that in this disintegration of the family unit, it kind of provides the child or the teenager the opportunity to kind of become their own guide and to find their own way. Is that, did yes. I hear that right? And become parents in a new way. And become parents in a new and way. Treat, and uh, treat their children differently from the way they were treated. Mm. And if, if they've actually w awakened, awakened to the reality of being this live being on this planet, then they can refresh this whole um, separating system. You know, we're not here. One of the most difficult things is that the law that we now have says that everybody is subject to that law. So the parents are subject to the law. And it, the, the priority is being um, obedient to the law, and but they don't. They're not. They get into a squabble, and the law then takes over and dictates to the child. Well, the law and the legal custodians don't have a clue about the child. They don't care about the child deeply mm. the way the parent can. But it's very, very difficult because, you know, for the past 100, 150 years, divorce has been growing and growing and growing. Now people are not even getting married in order to avoid that. But we have to make a commitment. We get together as I've had three mothers for my children and the commitment is to the child. Mm. We have to take care of the child mm. and the child has to somehow grow up in this very divided culture and be whole. Yeah. And he needs all the help he can get or she does. Yeah. And, um, Earlier in the piece, too, you said a, a beautiful, beautiful line, and it was that our divisions are superimposed on an already existing unity. And, you know, I think one of the things that we share cross-culturally, no matter what religion or country you're from, is that we all deeply care about the future of our children. You know, and I think that's something that we can all agree on and well, attest I think, to. Yeah, we agree on it. However, people are having miserable lives and they can barely survive by themselves. There's huge numbers of people that are un, you know, unable to care for themselves, unable to care for their child. So, and is the answer to that a state system? I don't know. I think it's more, I think it's family. I think it's people. If we're in a family and we've got brothers and sisters, cousins, uncles, aunts, the economic unit, it seems to me, should be supported by the whole family hmm. as far as it can stretch. The other point that you brought up that I think is really important, or I brought it up and you responded to it, is that being here together on this planet, 
one species. We are all almost identical. The, the physical being is our fingernails, our nose, every part of our being is shared. Somehow we've grown ourselves with, into this condition. Now we have to, in effect, celebrate that condition and heal the division that has been really legislated over us. But we've fallen into a belief of it that profoundly affects our lives. So we have to kind of clean out a lot of internal dialogue, a lot of interior stuff in order to wake up and be present for our children. Beautiful. Okay, well, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Michael. And until next time, join us for another Harmonious Podcast episode. And to stay connected with us and Peter's book, Notes from the West Pole, Create a Harmonious Life in an Adversarial Culture, you can visit www.harmonious.com. And that's Harmony Us with a Y. So until next time.